Essentially, we're here to talk about plugged and abandoned wells. And for individuals that might not know what that is, it's also called the PNA. Um, and just a really high level for that operation is essentially a workover rig, a small workover rig comes to the wellhead and they pump cement into the well bore at intervals that are regulated by the COGCC. And this prevents oil and gas from flowing into the well bore. This process, process generally takes several weeks and then when it's done the wellhead is removed the casing is cut and capped and left with an identifying marker then any associated equipment is removed and the surface is reclaimed to match the existing landscape so that's that's the operation that uh, we're here to talk about and what we want to do just like Kirby said is help everybody realize that there's resources out there there's obviously a lot of competing land use um, so we want to bring awareness to what those tools and resources are uh, and then we're going to look at it actually from a state perspective a local government perspective and then an operator <coughs> perspective so with that I'll go ahead and kick it over to Dave Andrews with the COGCC and he's going to talk about um, what resources are available there and their orphan well program Oh. And one thing, we have a lot of content to cover in the next 50 minutes. So what we're going to do, Mike, Mike should go off, whoever's talking with it connected. There we go. Uh, um, so we want to go ahead and get through each, we have three presentations, and then we'll all come back on stage and we'll do Q&A at that point. And then if for some reason we don't get to all the the questions, all four of us will be available after the panel to circle up and continue discussing. So. Morning, I'm Dave Andrews, and I'm just waiting for my presentation to pop up here. Good morning. I'm uh, pleased to be speaking again at the Energy and Environment Symposium this year. Uh, today I'll pro provide an overview of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission surface development policy and some resources for local planners and surface developers to identify plugged in abandoned oil and gas wells. Again, I'm Dave Andrews. I'm the Commission's Orphaned Well Program Manager. I started with the Commission in our Denver office in 2006. I transferred to the West Slope as our Engineering Supervisor in 2009. And then just recently in March of this year, I was uh, promoted to the Program Manager position. Uh, first, we'll review some challenges related to plug plugged wells and new building construction. Uh, second, we'll explore the surface development policy and content of an upcoming revision to that policy. And third, I'll share a recent surface development example and resources that commission staff use to share information with the landowner. Okay, I'm not sure if this is going to work. IT support, please. <laughs> Should I just try the mouse? I'll use the mouse. Okay. Uh, to start off, the commission does not regulate uh, local planning or construction codes. Um, however, at times both operators and commission staff are faced with challenges related to plugged or old wells to be plugged that are near uh, buildings or residences. On the left we see a front range operator uh, replugging a well and this well was less than five feet away from a home in Weld County. Uh, the well was originally plugged in 1988 and the recent work was required as an offset mitigation condition of approval 
uh, for a new horizontal well. On the right, the commission plugged an orphaned well about 20 feet away from a home in Uray County. Uh, this well was originally drilled in 1947, and then it was left to the landowner by the operator as a domestic gas well. In that case, the landowner had the mineral rights, and they chose to continue operating the well until uh, about the mid-1980s. So currently, uh, the commission has a surface development policy that was drafted and adopted in 2001. That policy states that if a surface developer disturbs a plugged well in any way, uh, the commission considers that action a modification to the well bore and an oil and gas operation as defined in our Oil and Gas Conservation Act. The surface developer may be liable for any costs and reporting resulting from the operation. And the situation may also apply if the surface developer encounters exploration and production waste um, during the construction. Our existing policy and our forthcoming revision will maintain uh, the same stance on this matter regarding liability. Uh, that uh, new revision of the policy um, should be coming out within the next few months. Uh, the primary intent of the changes for the policy are to address um, different processes that are in place. Uh, again, the first policy was developed in 2001, so we've had many rule changes, changes in process as far as um, oil and gas operations and the forms that need to be submitted um, for an oil and gas operation. So with our new policy, uh, one thing that we want to do, to do is establish a central point of contact. I've been nominated as that contact. Uh, so if a call comes in, one of the first things I'm going to do is try to determine if it's an active oil and gas operator or if it's a uh, potentially an orphan well where we have no liable operator. And then I will coordinate with or refer the matter to other staff in the engineering uh, unit or the environmental unit. In all cases, the commission recommends that surface developers and contractors complete the Colorado 811 one call requirements prior to any excavation. Uh, again, if the matter is related to an active oil and gas, gas operator, we may have other commission staff involved, and then they would coordinate directly with that active oil and gas operator. For other situations, surface developers will often hire a qualified oil and gas operator uh, to perform work, uh, well, seek approval, perform the work, and report on that work. And the benefit to the surface developer in that case is that they are in control of timing of the situation, which is usually an issue if you have earth moving equipment on, on location. Uh, if the surface developer has time to wait and it falls under the eligibility criteria for an orphaned well, uh, then there is some potential that they could uh, transfer it over to the state list. Uh, we would prioritize that work and then notify the surface developer when uh, that's about to occur. That may be months or potentially years later, uh, depending on available funds and also uh, existing conditions and how it fits into prioritization with other projects. So there, there are three conditions that would um, allow a project to be eligible for the orphaned well program. Uh, number one, there would be no liable oil and gas operator. Number two, the surface developer or contractor has not disturbed or modified the plugged well in any way. And number three, a hazard to human health, the environment, or wildlife resources exists, such as active leaks of oil, gas, or produced water, or the presence of exploration and production waste. This above grade marker provides an obvious indication that the surface developer may encounter a plugged well. However, marker type is selected by the operator and the landowner when the well is plugged. Um, so you may have either an above grade marker or a below grade marker.
Here's an example of a below grade marker that was discovered during installation of an electric utility. Uh, they had a heads up in this case that they knew there may be a well nearby, so they were digging carefully in that area, and then the uh, below grade marker wasn't covered. The commission encourages due diligence by planners and surface developers. We do have resources uh, available to um, help identify uh, old wells, uh, primarily from the 1950s on. Uh, the commission was formed in the mid-1950s. In some cases, we do have uh, data for older wells, uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, this was an example where there was a, a well that was drilled prior to the 1950s that was not mapped in our system. Um, as you can see, it was covered up by a board and that got moved over. Uh, this was discovered by a surface developer when they were installing um, utilities for a planned subdivision. COGCC has uh, a, a lot of information on our uh, geographic information system and our database. Uh, so starting on this map, I can get the pointer to work here. So on, on our website, we have a link to maps. And then when you click that link, this other screen down here will show up. Uh, click here to access our interactive map. So the first thing you'll see are primarily uh, section lines, township and range lines, and then you'll see lots of red dots when you zoom in, if it's an area with, with uh, active or former oil and gas operations. The red dots represent uh, either current or uh, plugged wells. We have uh, what are called scout cards on our system that contain uh, other helpful links uh, to available information. A few that I'll go over today. Uh, first of all, GIS links directly to the map. So if you happen to be on the scout card for that well and you click that link, it will zoom into that well on our map. Also, we'll uh, take a quick look at uh, documents here. These are scanned documents of reports that have been submitted to the commission uh, for that particular well. And we have a link to uh, inspections or field inspections. So uh, when our field inspectors go out to locations, uh, they file reports, those go on our system. So those are available for the wells. Um, if you're looking for a related facility, uh, not that particular well, we have another link to uh, related over here. So I'll briefly go through an example today. This was uh, the example where they were digging that trench for the underground electric utility and passed by the plugged and abandoned well. Uh, this was in Adams County uh, about a month and a half ago. Uh, the well in question is down here in the southeast of the southwest of that section. And the other well uh, tied into that lease, uh, or one of the wells, was this one up in the northwest of the southwest. And there was a former tank, whoops, wrong button. There was also a former tank battery located about uh, midpoint between the wells off to the northeast a little bit. Um, in the next few slides, you'll see those two wells along with Spring Gulch traveling from uh, southwest up to the northeast. So aerial photographs are helpful when we are reviewing these situations. In this case, um, I've got an aerial photograph from 1999 and again from 2015. Uh, both of these wells were plugged around 1990, but you can see in the uh, 1999 aerial photograph uh, an access road coming through here. Uh, this is kind of the, the main road uh, off to the east. So this was helpful in identifying the potential location of the tank battery that was associated with those two wells. This slide depicts um, what you might see when you click the documents link on the scout card. So we have uh, information 
when the wells were constructed. In this case, we also had a report of an intent to abandon the well and then a follow-up report after the well was uh, abandoned. That way we've got um, uh, information on well, well bore construction methods and where plugs were placed. This is what appears uh, when you click the field inspection link on the scout card for the well. Uh, so in this case, we had two inspections, one, one that was performed uh, shortly after the well was abandoned in 1991, and then another report in 2018. Uh, the 2018 report was in response to the request from the landowner um, about the potential presence of the well. Uh, so we met with the landowner out on location, uh, uh, identified where we might think the well uh, could be, and then uh, when he uncovered it, we went back out and took some photos. So this is a, a wider view of the same photo I showed before, and you can see the uh, below ground marker for the well, and then the uh, trench for the electrical, underground electrical. So in cases where uh, wells are avail or, or meet, meet the criteria that I went through before for the uh, orphaned well program, um, COGCC, uh, as part of the program, we may remove uh, old junk equipment, uh, perform environmental remediation. Uh, in this case, this was the well before plugging, while well, we were rigged up for plugging. Uh, reclamation following plugging, which for surface developers um, that may not matter as much if you're putting in a subdivision, uh, but in areas where um, there, there's no uh, plans for development, reclamation may be needed. And then uh, final after reclamation. So we, we do follow up monitoring until vegetation uh, uh, is established, uh, similar to what an operator would have to do. And I, again, I think we'll take questions at the end. Thanks. This one works. Um, thanks, Dave. Next, we're going to go ahead. <laughs> Next, we're going to go ahead and introduce Chad Calvert, and he is the government relations manager at Noble Energy. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I don't have a slide presentation. I don't. So if you have a hard time following along with the images you see behind me, it's because they're not my slides. Um, I'm just going to talk, um, and I promised Heidi I would be quick and help her stay on time. And I'll keep an eye on your little signs there, Heidi. Um, uh, I'm the manager of government relations and external affairs for Noble Energy in Colorado. Um, I've worked in a variety of um, places prior to this, including at the Department of Interior long ago with uh, Mr. Matt McCowan uh, in the, I guess it was the early 2000s. Um, but I, at Noble in Colorado, I, um, I manage our relationships with elected leaders at the local, state, and federal level. Um, I'm policy counsel to our business unit. Um, I work in close co cooperation with our regulatory policy advisor, who's also here, Kate Fay. In case you have met her, please do. Um, and then I also, um, you know, we, we work across legislative and regulatory lines uh, at the state and federal level. I'm also political counsel on election issues, I'm having a really fun year this year. Um, we've, got, we've got ballot measures, we've got candidates for office, uh, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of activity, and it's uh, a very complex world uh, in 2018. Um, I also work with local elected officials, uh, including municipal and county um, officials, which for Noble really is Weld County and the municipalities that are in Weld County. Um, and I share those duties with our land team and with our permitting teams. Um, and I also get to manage um, community relations, and, and I have a team of folks who help with stakeholder relations and community partners. Um, so what I'm going to talk about briefly here is uh, what, what Noble's up to in Colorado and, and why that matters for this discussion on P&A. Um, how we developed an impact mitigation model for our front-end development that um, today we're applying to our, the back-end of development. So when we're P&A in Wells, we're actually applying those impact mitigation standards um, to our P&A program, which um, was sort of an evolution. Today it seems rational and logical, but uh, I got to say that not all engineers think that way. And I'm not an engineer, and I, I actually have a I have a request. Can we stop calling it plug and abandon, right? Because we're not literally abandoning these wells. Um, and when you're talking to the public, it's hard for the, they they actually conflate plug and abandoned wells with orphaned wells, and they they often don't understand the difference between abandonment 
and orphan wells uh, because they sound kind of the same. So we're actually trying to um, sort of rebrand it as plugging in and decommissioning, plugging in and removal when we're talking to the public. Um, it just sounds like something, which is actually more than what we're doing. Um, because oftentimes we're plugging and abandoning wells on leases that we're going to continue to produce, right? We're not literally abandoning that leasehold. Um, but I, I, I chalk this up to the engineer's mind. Um, in, in a prior life, I worked at BP, and I had the, the great pleasure of uh, doing spill response in 2010 for the Macondo event. And um, I was just shocked over and over again for the terms that the engineers would come up with. Uh, do any of you remember junk shot? Um, it, was, it was one of the great ideas that that our engineers had to, um, to plug that Macondo well. They were going to dump a bunch of golf balls and, and other things down the hole, and they said, junk shot. And I was in D.C. doing the spill response, and I see it on CNN. You know, BP's going to try junk shot, and I thought, what? Who, you know, who's branding this stuff? This is terrible. Anyway, I digress. Um, so some facts about Noble. Noble's um, the second largest producer of, by volume in, this, in the state, uh, behind Anadarko. Then you have in the other top ten, you've got PDC, BP, Extraction, Crestone, SRC, Keras, and Ursa. Um, so by volume, we produce about uh, 27 million barrels of oil equivalent a year um, in Colorado, at least in 2017. Hopefully that will be going up this year. Uh, but we have the largest number of operated wells. Um, Noble acquired Patina in 2000. I think it was 14, or sorry, 2007. Um, and so that, that left us with about 7,200 operated wells in the front range. Uh, today, about 1,400 of those wells are horizontals. Uh, the rest are verticals. And um, they sit on about 365,000 acres. It's all in Weld County. Uh, Noble will spend about $800 million this year on new development. Um, we bring on about 100 wells a year for, uh, with first gas sales, and those are extended reach, so really by well equivalent, it's about almost 200 wells a year. Average length is about 10,000 feet, and our record this last year for drilling an extended reach ladder was four days. Um, so um, 2013, uh, Noble was still operating in um, some semi-urban areas, including Broomfield. Um, today, most of our acreage is, we're quite fortunate, is not only east of Weld County Road 49, if you're familiar with it, but frankly, if you drew a line from Hudson up to Evans, everything's east of that. So we're not really in urban or semi-urban areas anymore. Um, so that when we develop this impact mitigation to go in on the front end before development would occur, we're really not having to do that anymore. We're not operating any municipalities. Uh, our nearest neighbors tend to be the rancher who owns the property that we're on. Um, so. In that instance, we find ourselves uh, fortunate, but the process, the systematic process we developed in probably 2014 was um, to insert our stakeholder relations folks, and I think Anna Darko did a very similar thing, probably did it better than us, but um, to insert our process um, into that planning of the business unit so that there was thinking ahead of the, ahead of the development you know, what sorts of mitigation might we need to do? What kind of communication did we need to do with the community? What kind of uh, upfront work did we have to do? Um, September, so I'm going to do a little case study here, and this was a real eye-opener for me. In September 2014, we were planning to P&A a well in the Broadlands subdivision in Broomfield, and I don't know if any of you are from Broomfield, if you recall that. Um, but this was a well, uh, an actual well sitting on one side of a tee box and the tank battery on the other side of the tee box and surrounded by $800,000 homes. Um, it was a well that needed to be removed. It was drilled in 92 by Garrity. Um, Patina acquired it in 97. We acquired it in 2007. Um, but for context, the golf course in the neighborhood were platted in 1997, so uh, five years after the well was sitting there, right? And they, um, the nearest homes were built in 2000, 2001, so they're putting these homes, like literally, you know, 500 feet from the, or less from this well and tank battery, and selling them for $800,000, um, which, you know, sort of belies how much people actually cared about the tank battery. I, I, I didn't really understand it, but there it was sitting on the tee box. So we had to go in and P&A the well and remove the tanks um, in the middle of golf season, right? So people are like this, and we got a workover rig sitting behind them. Um, and so we had to do a lot of advanced communication with the, with the golf course, with the community, with the homeowners association, with Bro with Broomfield. Um, and we learned a lot in that. In fact, unfortunately, we found soil contamination when we removed the tank battery. So then we had to dig, and we had to dig like a 60-foot hole next to the tee box. Um, but ahead of all of this, we had gone in and met with the Homeowner Association. We'd done communications that they could send out to the, the folks. Um, we 
did door hangers on all the doors, literally going around like a canvassing operation and knocking on doors. Um, we had an 800 number. We worked with the Homeowner Association on timing, so it was daylight only. It was only during the week. Uh-oh, i got five minutes. Um, <laughs> it was only during the week. Uh, we, we, didn't, we weren't out there during the season when the kids were going to the swimming pool, which happened to be like 500 feet away. Um, and what I learned was people can tolerate an enormous amount of disruption if they think you're leaving, right? <laughs> so so when, uh, we would put signs up and say, this is not a fracking operation, and we're leaving. And people were like, OK, well, we don't care. You know, hurry up and get, get on with it. Um, but, but what that taught us was you really have to have this front-loaded communication strategy with the local government, with the homeowners associations, with any sort of community you can find. If you're going to be operating P&A, um, you know, work over rig and removal stuff uh, in, in a na place where there are people who live around you. So today, um, let's see, 2015, as I said, we had 7,200 wells, 6,000 of those were vertical. Um, we put 2,400 of those wells on a PNA schedule uh, in, in 2015. So in 2015, we PNA 221 wells. 2016, we PNA 400. This last year, we PNA 530. This year, we'll PNA over 600. Um, it's two per day. And we've got 18 workover rigs running just sort of continuously daylight hours only. But, um, you know, th this is just this, this slog through all of these old vertical wells. And um, on top of that, we're moving all the tank batteries. So there's a lot of activity. And, and what, we've, what we've done, we've gis everything, and we've figured out exactly which ones are in proximity to municipalities or, or unincorporated homeowners, uh, you know, subdivisions. And we're trying to get in ahead of time to meet with the local government folks, LGD, um, any HOAs that are that are um, around and talk to them about what we're doing, right? And then uh, door hang the neighborhoods. Um, uh, we've d we've done um, you know newsletter stuff into into HOAs and frankly, when people know what you're doing, they don't ask questions. It's it's you don't let other people come up with what you're you know make up the story about what you're doing. And that's really I guess is the message here is that it's it's on the operators to make sure people understand what's going on. And I find that after you've sort of been up front and transparent with people, they're, they're really accepting, at least in terms of the back end. Um, let's see. So in the interest of keeping on time, Heidi, I will move on quickly. Um, we have, uh, so we've got the 2,400 wells on the schedule, um, 1,200 tank batteries. But then we have another thousand wells on the PNA schedule that are outside of our 18-month window. So we really are PNA an enormous amount of wells. And I would say that a couple of things: farmers really like it, right? You're getting these old vertical wells out of the farm fields, out of the circles. Um, communities really like getting these out of the from their parks or whatever sort of space has been left open in their subdivision. Um, communities like not having the truck traffic going in and out of these tanks that are you know truck loading. Um, Frankly, removing a lot of tank batteries um, improves air emissions for the, you know, the inventory for the air emissions because every tank is associated with a certain amount of air emissions. Um, and it reduces truck traffic generally. So we, we sort of branded this Noble Neighbor Program, um, and, and it's about communicating with folks. It's also about prioritizing the P&A of those wells that are in communities, that are in proximity to um, homes. And, and we've got a kind of a matrix of... Uh, you know, it, it has to do with whether they're economic or marginally economic, but we also have put in there, is it in a community and should we be getting it out of there? And that's, that was kind of the strategy behind the Broomfield well. I will stop there. I have more, but I'll stop and um, maybe make time for Q&A at the end. Thank you very much. Record, I'm not a drill sergeant. I just have to keep this on track, or Kirby's not going to let me go to the steak fry. So, um, next up, we have Chad Elkins, and he's a civil engineer with the city of Longmont. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jason Elkins with the city of Longmont. Uh, I'm the oil and gas coordinator. Uh, I'm here to tell you uh, about the plug and abandon investigation that we've been doing uh, that has since been uh, extended to all oil and gas facilities within the city of Longmont. All right, so very briefly, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, history of the site investigations, uh, the scope of the investigations, the costs, uh, our initial results, and uh, where you can find this information on our city website. 
So back in 2012, the city of Longmont identified that uh, it did not know very much uh, about the oil and gas facilities located within the city limits. So they hired Terracon to go out and do a records investigation. And that records investigation consisted of uh, digging up um, all the uh, um, incident reports and all the um, documentation found at the COGCC level and uh, as well as within our uh, planning files and uh, delivered that report in 2013 and that report is available on our website as well. Since then, um, uh, we have then expanded that from a records investigation to an actual environment investigation. So they extended that out to do groundwater monitoring within all active wells. And so since then, within about the past year, we've now expanded that to all oil and gas facilities. It used to be just active, now it's everything. So this here, this is a map. This, I generated this off of the COGCC's uh, GIS, web, uh, uh, GIS map based system. And as you can see, we have about 18 plugged in abandoned wells. We have eight active wells. We have about a handful of dry and abandoned uh, locations. And then we've also identified uh, about a half dozen pit locations that we're going to investigate. So the scope of the services basically entails going out there, drilling three groundwater monitoring wells. These are permanent. Uh, we can go out there at any time that we want. We can pull, grab samples, and we can analyze the water. Uh, the way they're configured is we have one up gradient upstream of the wellhead and two down gradient. The two down gradient ones should capture any contaminations, and the one up gradient, in theory, should be a control. We also install two soil vapor points. The soil vapor points, uh, we will put those within about 30 foot of the wellhead. Um, each location is different and unique because of all the where the production facility is located in relation to the wellhead. And so we will tailor each location, each investigation to try to encompass everything found there. So investigation costs, this is what uh, a lot of people are very interested in. Uh, on average, it costs about $16,000 per site. And again, that kind of varies plus or minus a few thousand depending upon uh, the investigation. Um, case in point, we were out there uh, uh, doing a plugged and abandoned investigation on the George Maeda well. We got some low-level uh, signs of VOCs and that concerned us. So instead of doing two soil vapor, two soil vapor points, I believe we did upwards of five or six. And that was to try to capture to see if we had found the worst of it or if we had only uh, found the beginning of it. So again, uh, nine active wells that we have uh, within the city, 18 plugged and abandoned, uh, five dry and abandoned, four tank battery locations, three pits, and uh, we are expecting, when this uh, entire investigation is said and done, upwards of around a half million dollars. So the contaminants that we're testing for is uh, total, petro total petroleum hydrocarbons. That's uh, all the hundreds of compounds that are found in crude oil. Uh, VOCs, VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, that's the real nasty stuff that um, you know, is uh, carcinogenic uh, that you don't want to be breathing. Uh, then we look for methane to see if the wellhead's leaking, and uh, I'll just skip to the end. So far, none of them are leaking, so we have not detected any methane levels. Um, but we have found some uh, constituents of uh, BTEX and stuff. Uh, we also look for uh, chloride sulfates. Those are some of the constituents used in uh, developing uh, oil and gas wells. This here is a monitoring well diagram. This can kind of give you an idea of what we're installing. This right here is your water table. And if it's a groundwater monitoring well, we'll go about four to six feet into the groundwater table. So that way, uh, for seasonality, when there's runoff and stuff and the groundwater's high, we can capture water. And in uh, seasons where it's a drought and the groundwater uh, table drops, we can still capture water and pull samples. If it's a soil vapor point, it'll be a few feet above the groundwater table. And it's just a two inch uh, PVC perforated pipe. And uh, it allows us to go out there. We can install them permanently. like that, or we can install them a couple feet underground. Uh, it's less invasive that way, so if we're on someone's private property and they don't want to see uh, this unsightly monitoring well, uh, we can bury them a couple feet underground and we can locate them uh, with GPS. Moving forward, this is your typical, typical drilling rig. 
uh, they're just able to drive right onto location and drill. Uh, in areas where it's uh, uh, really tight and we can't get a vehicle in there, uh, we are able to just go in and hand, aug hand auger them. It takes a little bit uh, manpower, it takes a little bit longer, but uh, we've already done it uh, in a handful of locations and it, it works just, uh, just the same. So this here is the soil borings that we took uh, out at the Rider 1 site. This was where we identified the uh, tank battery location. And as you can see right there, that's uh, contaminated soil. Uh, if I was to have a small soil sample of that in this room, it, you would smell diesel come, uh, coming out of that soil. It was very, very potent. So again, this is a monitoring well. Uh, this is the cap. Um, we actually have to GPS these because uh, even though that it's about... Uh, eight inches in diameter. Uh, when you get grass and leaves and grass clippings uh, and it grows, uh, you won't be able to see it. So we have to GPS these and um, we can go out and take uh, samples whenever we want. This here is a real-time monitoring uh, device. So we are partnering uh, with local universities and other companies to do pilot uh, pilot projects. Um, this is a real-time monitoring device that allows us to see readings for methane and VOCs in real time and we can actually send that information uh, to a web-based browser and we can see it in real time and, and, and view that uh, uh, time versus um, uh, constituent log. And so then we can also put alerts in place. So if we see a 5% increase uh, in a change in value or something like that, that can alert us to go out and investigate to see what's going on. So that there's your power source and telemetry unit. That's your methane sensor that's dropped down into the soil vapor point and that's the wellhead location. So you can see we're, we're within about seven feet of where the known wellhead location is at. Uh, investigation results to date. So this is the Rider 1 uh, well site. If you look, sorry, if you look right here, that is the Trail Ridge Middle School. So the Rider 1 well site's about 300 feet away from the Trail Ridge Middle School. And so when we were out there conducting our uh, well site investigation, you saw the contaminated soil. So that kind of um, alerted us to what was potentially out there. Another uh, difficulty doing this uh, investigation is you can see this line right here. This is school district property. This is city owned property. So even though the wellhead is located on city property, the contamination plume now spans across two different parcels. So we partnered with the school district uh, and on their behalf, we went out and conducted the investigation and in overabundance of caution, we installed two soil vapor points on school district property just to ensure that that middle school um, uh, wasn't at risk and it's not. So the George Maeda well, this one's located on a golf course. This right here, I think that's hole number five at the Ute Creek Golf Course. That wellhead is located within about five feet of a private property line. And this is the one where we found low level signs of VOCs. And again, we were able to identify everything on our side of the fence. We were not able to identify everything on their side of the fence. So working with the homeowners, knocking on doors, um, I was able to get permission, uh, go in there and actually uh, conduct the investigation. And uh, so far, it's looking like everything's gonna be fine and that uh, nothing is at reportable limits and everything, um, um, the worst of it's on our side, but the worst of it is not reportable. So it's actually, uh, it's not been impacted. So the Mariama number one well, again, it's located within about five feet of apartment buildings. This is school district property as well. And the initial uh, investigation on that has um, come up clean. Longmont 810K, this one is out in our sandstone ranch um, um, open uh, open space. Uh, this one's recently been plugged in a band and this well was shut in due to uh, the flood back in 2013 has not been producing. We worked with the operator to get it plugged in a band in, and again this one came up clean. So another thing that uh, is included in that $500,000 overall estimate I gave you was identified uh, plugged in abandoned wells and active wells that's currently not in city limits, but at some point uh, from our comprehensive plan, we identify that it will potentially be annexed in. These two are, are two wells that have been identified. So the Tabor 7 well, that's an active well. Um, we went out there and did uh, an initial investigation on that. 
uh, and that came up clean. Uh, the Tanaka 1-11, that one's currently uh, going through uh, mining operations uh, in an industrial area. It's not going to be annexed for a, a few more years, and so when uh, the developer comes into annex, we will then perform uh, the plugged and abandoned investigation on that one. So this is the City of Longlots website. Uh, all investigation reports, all historic record reports are on our website. Uh, they have not been edited. They're directly from Terracon. Um, they're about 93 to 110 pages long. Uh, they're very detailed. Uh, if you would like to read them, you're welcome to go onto our website and download them. Uh, my contact information is on there. If you're interested in this program, if you want to know more about what we've done and what we are doing, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We still got about another 40 more locations to investigate, and it's probably uh, going to take us another two to three years. All right. Questions? All right, thank you, Jason. <laughs> okay, so we did it. So we have time for Q&A. So um, I know we just gave you guys a lot of information, but hopefully we left enough time for questions. So if you guys want to pop up here. So again, we have Dave Andrews with the COGCC, Chad Calvert with Noble, and Jason Elkins with Longmont. So if anyone has questions, we'll go ahead and just start directing them towards the right person. This question is for Chad. Chad, I wholeheartedly agree with you about the need to discontinue the use of plug and abandon. Abandon has such a negative, irresponsible, um, careless connotation to it. So how do we do that? All of your presentations today use that term. I suspect that your door hangers and all of your communications going out to the neighborhoods may be using that term. It's time for us to start saying, let's decommission. Let's not plug in a man, let's decommission. So I challenge you as you're going forward with all of these pluggings and abandonments, i.e. decommissionings, that you're going to be facing over the next couple of years to start using decommission instead of plugging them down. has to start somewhere, and I think Noble should be the trendsetter. <laughs> Do you agree? Folks? Amen. I'll just say amen. Thank you. <laughs> no, we actually are using plug and decommission uh, in, our, in our signage and in our door hangers and um, plug and removal sort of interchangeably. Uh, but changing engineers' terms is going to be a bigger lift. Um, I think former COGCC director Matt Lepore is here. Maybe they could start at the COGCC and change the tab for uh, well status. A year ago, <laughs> very, um, at this very session, I had that conversation with Matt Lepore. Dave, sir. Yeah. So one, one other, or a couple other thoughts on that. Uh, number one, it's defined in our rules as plugged and abandoned, and secondly, it's uh, likely in state statute in several places as plugged and abandoned. So uh, that would be a pretty complete overall if we had to go down that road. Please no more rulemaking this summer. <laughs> I was going to say that I think what Chad talked about and what Noble's doing, that if you're in conversations with stakeholders, if you can help provide that clarity while we might not be able to do an overhaul of the rules, just the dialogue I think is important. So I think that what Noble's doing is definitely the place to start. All right, next question. So I'd like to briefly hear from each presenter because I'm pretty sure that they're each going to provide a different answer. But for the local governments who are regulating the surface development around these plugged and abandoned wells, what would you recommend the setback be? You know, certainly you don't want to build on top of it, but what would the recommended setback be? So one thing I will say is that we have been wanting to keep this very much to plug and abandonment and not get into proposed setbacks and things that are as of a, other conversations, but if any, everybody is okay. Oh, okay. So for City of Longmont, for any residential development wanting to come in and uh, develop around a plugged and abandoned well, our setback uh, limit is 150 feet. And uh, there's, we don't have any hard math or any hard data or scientific fact to back that up. It's just from a planning perspective, uh, to, if, if that well ever has to be replugged and abandoned, to be able to get a workover rig in there, to be able to get generators, manpower, 
uh, tanks and stuff. Uh, 150 feet seems like that's about enough area um, where you can get uh, a workover rig in there to replug it and abandon. Anything closer to that and it, you, have, you have heightened risk and you need to look at the risk assessment to see if you're willing to accept that. But the city of Longmont does not offer any variances for anything less than 150 feet. So from the state's perspective, um, and I've been through this with management, we do not have a number to throw out there. Uh, we, we do agree that structures should not be constructed on top of wells. Uh, in, in the event that a rig needs to get back over the well, um, you're kind of out of options other than demolishing the structure at that point. Um, the, the other thing that we uh, would suggest for planners, though, is also consider not just um, you know getting rig on, o over the well, but also leaving room for heavy equipment to access the well. So if, if the well is completely blocked in by uh, homes and there's no way to access, that could be a, another issue. I don't really have anything to add. I mean, this issue's been brought up to us before, and it was it, you just need to leave enough space for access to get back to the well if something were to happen. Right? So I think that really is it. All right, next question. Some oil and gas leases and surface use agreements require to plug and abandon wells three feet below or below plow depth. Does the COGCC have a preference on plugging with the above ground method or below ground? So our, our rules leave that entirely up to an agreement with the operator and the surface owner. I would say more and more often, um, most folks are opting for below grade markers at this point. And we've even had situations through our orphan program where the landowner will call us up and ask us to cut off the marker, um, which, which is another important point. So during my presentation, I indicated that if the surface developer or landowner disturbs the well in any way that's considered an oil and gas operation, um, so it's best to consult with us uh, before even contemplating cutting off markers. Next question. Uh, is uh, in Pierce, we have uh, a house that was built probably within 50 feet of an old abandoned well. And it was probably 20, 30 years ago that it was abandoned. And this is in Weld County. And um, is there any monitoring that the state does? Or who's responsible? I'm not even sure if the company's in business anymore that used to run it. So uh, in, in situations with that, uh, we would encourage landowners, if you uh, suspect there's an issue for any reason, to um, contact us. Um, ordinarily, uh, there are no follow-up uh, inspections unless um, there is a, you know, a suspected issue. Um, so what you could do is look back through our well files, uh, see when the last field inspection was performed. Um, if you have any reason to uh, believe that a well might be leaking, um, you can certainly contact us. We can run through a consultation, do a desktop review, and uh, potentially send a field inspector out. I guess for Jeff, uh, I'm impressed with what you guys have done in Longmont. Uh, do you guys ever look out of state? There's been wells drilled for over 100 years. 100 years production in Beverly Hills, in the LA Basin, with million dollar homes right next to pumping units and stuff like that. So do you guys ever look outside the state and what other states are doing? Because uh, it, it's interesting to me how you go to Huntington Beach, you got a steam flood right next door to $5 million condos. You know, people aren't that worried about the in California or Texas or different areas, and it seems like Colorado, they want to go to this 2,500-foot setback, but in so many areas in the U.S., uh, homes are even closer than 150 feet, if you say. So outside of Colorado, I, I really can't say. Um, uh, looking at the state of Colorado from, from all that I've gathered, the investigation that we're doing I believe that we are the only only municipality that's doing this type of investigation and uh, Longmont's definitely taking a very proactive um, approach at this and uh, 
we just want to make sure that uh, the community is safe and, 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 and we're trying to capture that and be as transparent about that uh, as much as possible. Um, but outside, um, outside other states and stuff, I, I really can't, can't comment. So. I have a question um, for you too, Jason. Asking about the five hundred thousand dollars in costs for the for the um, efforts that you're doing was that appropriated by your city council, and have you been able to identify any opportunities to recover any of those costs? Uh, so um, that is not a budgeted item just yet. Um, I'm putting in for a budget request this year to cover the next. Uh, two to three years worth of investigation. Uh, currently, uh, I am funded through a contingent, uh, the city council has a contingency fund. Uh, last year they had about $100,000 in it. We asked for $96,000 to get this uh, plugged and abandoned investigation um, off and running. And um, this year we're hoping to be fully funded. Will I get the full half million dollars? I'm not sure. That is a very high level number. That's a padded number. Um, I'm still working on the exact figure, but um, I would say I'm um, probably within fifty thousand dollars of, of what what would be expected. Fortunately for Longmont, we only have about fifty-two total oil and gas facilities. We're very fortunate in that regards. That um, while a half million dollars sounds like a lot of money, to be able to capture everything that's happening within your city, um, we think that's money um, worth spending. Um, we understand that not all municipalities would be able to do this type of um, investigation for all their oil and gas facilities. It just wouldn't economically be feasible. But there are methods to this investigation that uh, could probably be reduced uh, to create uh, better bang for your buck for uh, municipalities that are subject to hundreds, if not thousands, of wells. Looks like we've. Oh, okay, you got a microphone there. Uh, yes, it comes to mind, why are taxpayers responsible for any of these type of programs? Why isn't the companies, like they make their trade associations, why aren't they pooling into a fund to take care of this abandonment and closure and stuff? Because many of their members drop out occasionally, they're no longer around, but this pool should be made such that taxpayers aren't responsible for cleaning up this mess. So I'll say from Longmont's perspective, the city of Longmont, the residents, they they want to pay for it. They want to know what's going on in their backyard. Um, so they're happy to do it. We're going above and beyond what is required. Um, uh, so. In the case of Ryder, where we found contamination, we're working with the COGCC um, to have the operator remediate that. And so, um, as long as there's no contamination there, we, the city of Longmont, have no reason to go after any operators to have them pay for this uh, investigation. The, the residents are happy to do it, but I don't know, if David, if you have anything to add to that. So I, I would say it's really a, a three-tiered process. Uh, number one, active operators are responsible for plugging and abandoning their own wells. So uh, first thing, you know, it would be the operator uh, directly paying for that. Uh, second, if an operator is either goes bankrupt or um, is is otherwise, uh, you know, not not able to uh, perform the plugging and abandonment, then the commission would claim uh, the bond, plugging and abandonment bond from that operator. So if it's a uh, fee minerals lease, that would be the state. If it's a federal minerals lease, that would be the federal government that would maintain the plugging and abandonment bond from the operator. And then last, uh, if the well were to fall under our orphaned well program, uh, the funding for that program and our agency comes uh, from severance taxes and no levies on the industry, so indirectly they're still paying for it that way. There are a lot of ideas, I think, about how to try to get at more aggressively the, the existing orphan wells, but I would say, um, and I think they're all still you know, sort of on the table for discussion, um, but an orphan well happens because the operator is no longer solvent, and so you know, the one, one issue is if other companies are going to step in who are, who are, who are solvent, are going to step in and, and take care of somebody, some, some, uh, an issue that somebody else left, 
Um, there's a fairness, you know, we, you want all of the operators to do that, not just a couple of the operators who might feel the need to do that. And that's why mill levy or severance tax is a much more equitable way to do it because everybody's paying into the mill levy based on the production. Um, but there are instances, and I will say this, where, an op where a current operator nobles experienced this several times in the last year, where we are planning to do a horizontal development and, and the offset wells in the, is sort of the search for the offset wells that we may need to either plug while we're doing the, the drilling and, and completion or P&A. Um, we've been asked or, or directed as a condition of approval by the COGC to, to re-P&A an un The uh, fines from enforcement um, also go into a uh, line item in our budget that is used for plugging abandoning orphan dwells. I got a question for uh, City of Longmont. Um, are you um, are you monitoring are you monitoring all other similar type of industries to this level? Uh, no. Point so, blank, no. So you're not monitoring things like gas stations, other type of in, other type of uh, other type of industrial sites or anything like that. Just specifically oil and gas. I don't want to answer incorrectly, but I believe oil uh, gas stations are regulated at the state. Is that different agency? Different. It's, it's a different agency, but no, we're um, the investigation that we're doing is not covering gas stations or anything like that. It's not uh, propane refill stations, nothing like that. This is all just oil and gas um, related facilities. I have a question for David. David, I noticed at the beginning you said that uh, some new rules coming out for sometime this year regarding surface developers and you're saying like subdivision developers or whatever would assume liability for the wells? So that is um, currently stated in our 2001 uh, policy that uh, if a developer or a contractor, um, you know, what may happen is they'll run into a well with their bulldozer and call us up and say, hey, I've got a problem. We just ran into an oil and gas well, a plugged well with our bulldozer. And, um, you know, our, what we would do is go to our policy and say, um, you know, you are responsible because that is considered uh, by the commission as an oil and gas operation because you disturbed the well. Um, so that has, you know, that policy has been in place since 2001. Uh, right now we're looking at revisions to that policy, but it's primarily just to uh, change the order of process on what that developer then needs to do. So, um, you know, filing registration as an operator, designation of agent, uh, going, you know, a uh, whole list of things similar to what an, an oil and gas operator would have to do for a, a normal oil and gas operation. So that would include bonding and... That's correct. So I know that we have a few other folks with questions, but Kirby is giving me dagger eyes that we need to stop. So what we can do is if maybe all of us could go out to the hall or we could meet on our next break, we can... Uh, the next break that comes, so I think there's one session after us before the break. We're happy to meet and we'll continue any other questions. Um, thank you guys. Thank you.